Today we will talk about how to save your marriage. How to save your marriage. All of us know somebody who has either experienced or may be currently experiencing some challenges in their marriage. Unfortunately, the, the reality is that there are huge numbers of, of individuals who are experiencing some challenges. Their marriages are in distress. Their marriages may be failing or may have already failed. In fact, the high divorce rate in the United States, which stands at about 50%, suggests that there are some challenges not only in the United States, but also suggests that there are some challenges here. We have our share of issues. Our divorce rate and failure rate on marriages are also very high. Uh, based on the stats that I looked at uh, early this morning, it was 25%. But I know that something is wrong with that figure because I know in the Bahamas that we have a tendency not to formalize the terminations of our marriages with divorce. For some reason or another, individuals tend to separate and uh, they just go their separate ways and they go on and they have their lives as though the marriages that they had no longer existed. So I know that that rate must be higher. But the question when asked, when individuals are asked to those who experience issues, how did you get to this point or to that point? And some will say that, well, we grew apart. We fell out of love with one another. And I guess the million dollar question is, how did they get to that point? where they grew apart, where they fell out of love with one another. Individuals who were no doubt at one time head over heel in love with one another. Something happened between the points. Something went wrong. And some would suggest that it has little to do with infidelity or poor communication, or incompatibility, or falling out of love, or growing apart, or financial difficulties, or many of the other reasons that are commonly cited, cited for the breakdown of marriages. But instead, it has everything to do with the two individuals involved in the marriage. Could it be that there was an inability for them to recognize very early on that there were some things that were going wrong? Could some intervention in that marriage perhaps salvage that relationship? Could it be with the help of God that they may have been able to turn that around? We don't know. But quite often when there is a challenge in a marriage, most people tend to give up. There's a great body of work available to assist us in discovering what are the key issues at hand that result in our marriages not lasting as God intended them to last. I want to encourage us to use that information to safeguard our marriages also to use that information to assist others in overcoming some of the pitfalls that destroy marriages today. I don't want to suggest to you that a starting point for us is to get a godly perspective on what marriage should be. This world has warped what we know as marriage as contained in the scriptures. So a godly view and a godly appreciation of what we should be looking at as marriage, I think is needed. I want to suggest to you that marriage is a relationship that should last until the death of one or both of the parties. I want to suggest to you that 
based on scriptural grounds that marriage is supposed to last. That God's intent for marriage is that it be till death do us part. Interestingly, when Jesus was confronted by the scribe and the Pharisees about the issue of divorce, he brought it back to the foundational truths concerning marriage, God's original intent. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. I said, they will no longer be two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. I want to suggest to you that God hates divorce. It was not in his original plan, not in his original design for the institution that we know called marriage. It is with this motivation, it is with this mindset, it is with this desire to please God that we should approach marriage. I remember so many years ago, uh, when I was being counseled by Brother Miller, well, me and Ellen being counseled, I probably ne needed more counseling than her. But when we were being counseled, one of the things that he always said, divorce should not be in your vocabulary. Divorce should not be in your vocabulary. It's been many, many years now, I forgot. Sometimes, you do the mass from 1889 to now, and I never ever forgot those words. You see, it set the perspective for me. It lined up my mindset. It helped me understand that when there are challenges and there are issues that you cannot take the easy way out as the world does. God's intent for marriage is the debt to his part. There is an escape clause, but it's held to the highest possible standard. I want to suggest to you also that marriage is a monogamous relationship. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Not one man marrying many women. Or one man or one woman having a relationship with somebody else outside of the marriage. God's original intent again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We, 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 we uh, spoke on it in Matthew. I'm now going to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Again, a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. Leaving father and mother and being joined to his wife, becoming one flesh. This world has a different perspective today. This world will tell us that it's okay for a man and a man or a woman and a woman to be united in, in holy matrimony, but that's far into the scriptures. And we will never ever allow that to come into the Lord's church. They could change the laws all they want, but I can tell you, I would never ever support it because God's word does not support it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as to himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Our dear brother tells us that each one of us should love our own wife. Not somebody else's. Or not someone else outside of your marriage. But there's also a strong encouragement for the wife to respect her husband. That is to hold him in high esteem, to admire him. And so there is an obligation that we have as husband and wives in a marriage towards one another. The husband to love his wife and the wife to respect her husband. I want to suggest to you that both husband and wife are equal before God. Both were created in the image of God. 
Genesis chapter 1 verse number 27 says, So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. First Peter 1 verse 3 and 7 tells us that as men and women, we are joint heirs to the grace of God and, and to his salvation. I know sometimes men, we may feel that we are superior to women. But God did not create us to be superior in that regard. And women, I know you may feel that you are wiser than the man, but you know, you're not necessarily so. In some cases you may be. But we are equal in the eyes of God. But there is a responsibility in a marriage. Although we are equal, there is a responsibility for the husband to love the wife. And there is a responsibility for the wife to submit herself to her husband. And to respect her husband. Not when she feels like. But always. I want to suggest to you also that the husband is the loving head of his wife. He's the head of his wife. He's the head of the family. But I said loving head. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 19 says husbands. Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That's important. The scriptures say that we ought not to be harsh with our wives. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, 24. It says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Now watch this now, verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in some things. You all wake up? In everything. And I guess some women find some challenge with that because they say, well, if I submit myself to this man and everything, he's going to take advantage. But if he's a loving head, he will not take advantage of you. And if he's not treating you as he should, come. Let the brother in know. Let's have a talk with him. I know when we walk down these aisles, we feel that we will have a perfect relationship. Yeah, we will have a perfect marriage that nothing will never go wrong within our marriages. But the reality is, things will go wrong. Challenges will surface. Problems will come. I know we don't want challenges. I know we don't want the problems, but they will come. And so this being the case, we must anticipate that issues will arise. And we must develop a mindset that's oriented towards overcoming and resolving the challenges that will come. We must pray. We must fast. And we must work at our marriages. You don't put a marriage on an automatic pilot and it just go ahead. Marriage involves work and much work. And it involves us being actively involved in working out the challenges that will arise in our marriages. I want to suggest to you that it also takes two to make it work. There are two parties to marriage. If the marriage will be successful, both parties must be willing to have it work. And so it takes two people actively working together. Prayerfully working together. And when you need help, get help. Our brother Kevin has a, a note in the bulletin on the second page. If you need some help, some counseling, he's there. Or we're there. Seek help. It's extremely important. If you have an issue, get some help. He went to school and he studied. Now I got some street knowledge. He got the book knowledge as it relates to the relationships. I think I got a little bit of wisdom. Uh, he got the theory <laughs> along with the wisdom. 
We sent them to school for a long time to get equipped. Utilize them. Don't allow your marriages to break up. Again, if you want some street, come see me. <laughs> I want to suggest to you that God's word has the solution to the issues and the challenges that we face in our marriages. Every challenge and issue that we face in our marriages can be resolved through God's word. And through us being willing to submit ourselves to the will of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, this is a powerful scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 31 through 32. It says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. I stopped and I, I looked at each one of those words. He says, let all bitterness. I looked it up and it says, anger, disappointment at being treated unfairly. It's an absence of sweetness. He says, put it away. He says, let all wrath. Extreme anger, he says, Put it away. He talked about anger. That strong feeling of annoying sometimes that the what husband calls to the wife or the wife calls to the husband. He says, put it away. Clamor. That loud, confused shouting and noise that you all make. He says, put it away. Evil speaking. Those ungodly words, those slanderous words, those damaging words that be uttered to one another. He says, put those things away. And he says, put them away from you with all malice. Malice. The intention or desire to harm someone. And sometimes we have an intention or desire to harm that spouse because of what they say or what they do. But he says, put these things away. So he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And he says, replace them with these things and be kind one to another. You all know what kind means? Do you remember how to be kind? He says, be kind one to another. He says, be tender hearted one to another. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And if you find it difficult to forgive your spouse, remember God didn't find it difficult to forgive you. With the same forgiveness that he extended to you, you'll be willing to extend that same forgiveness to your spouse. I know sometimes you say, well, I can't forgive you for what you would have done. What if God says that to us? What if he holds our offenses against us? Where would we be? Eternally lost. Without salvation and without hope. And sometimes we hold our spouses to a higher standard that we expect God to hold us to. Be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Man, as I can say, you only need that one scripture, you know. That's an all-encompassing scripture to deal with all the issues that many of us face in our marriages. We don't need to know everything in the book. We just need to know a couple of voices in the book. And if we could simply perfect this passage, this text... A lot of the issues and challenges that we face today will dissipate. You know, there's a, there's a study, there's a research that I always like to go back to. This is considered by many as the gold standard, as a reliable predictor of marriages that will fail. This is an empirical study that was put out by a university. 
They studied 135 couples over a period of time. They started the study before these individuals were married and they followed them into their marriages. And they monitored these individuals in their marriages. And at the end of the day, they came up with four risk factors. Four risk factors that are telltale signs whether or not a marriage will be successful or will fail. And I'm sure I would have shared these with you before. But I think that we need to be reminded of them. The first factor they talk about is escalation. And I know in the Bahamas we perfect the art of escalation. And that's perhaps why we have so much issues in our marriages. And according to the research, this negative risk pattern if practiced consistently in our marriages, it will result in our marriages failing. And escalation occurs when we negatively respond to each other. It is a negative exchange or and it's an argument where the parties continually up the ante. There's an increasing level of intensity of anger, annoyance, and harsh words. There's rage. And as it continues, the conversation becomes harsher and harsher and becomes more intense. And there's a back and forth retort to an extent where nobody wants to take the last. You ain't gonna have nothing on me, I gotta have the last word. No, you ain't gonna have the last word, I gotta have the last word. There's an onward continuous escalation of an argument. Sounds familiar? But the scripture deals with that, you know. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, it says, Do not repay evil for evil, or insult with insult. But when we get so heated and so hot, you insult me, well, I can insult you, I got, I got a better one for you. The scripture specifically tells us, do not repay evil for evil, or insult for insult. You see why I tell you the scripture that deal with all the issues we have? And again, go back, and look, if you only know two, Ephesians 4, 31, 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Even if you only just know those two, you could disarm escalation in your marriage. And so we have to be aware of these things. And when we see them happening, we just need to stop. Somebody need to be the stronger of the two. And sometimes, remember, it may be you. You may have to step forward and just stop the escalation. Stop the blow-ups. Because it is a risk factor. That if you continue to practice it, it will, it's an indication that there will be some serious challenges that will happen in your marriage in time. Over time, angry words, they cause harm. Over time, reckless words, they cause harm. For some, a harsh word may be like a sword through the heart. In fact, the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 18, it says, reckless words pairs like a sword. And so we ought to be careful with our words and be careful with the escalation. And when we're angry, we say some things that we ordinarily would not say. An angry person is like a drunk person. When you're drunk, you, you know, your tongue loose. You say some things that you ordinarily wouldn't say, but when we become angry, we become drunk with rage. And our tongue becomes loose. And we say things that we ordinarily would not say. James tells us in James chapter 1 verse number 20 says, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight ring on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Couples, if your marriage will survive, you must overcome escalation. You must diffuse it. 
You must learn to take control of your emotions. You must learn to keep a rein on your tongue. And I know sometimes we accuse women of having problems controlling your tongue. But some of us men, we got the same issues. If you want to save your marriage, look out for escalation. Diffuse the situation. I say sweep it under the carpet. We can talk about that. But diffuse the situation and deal with your problems as mature individuals in a rational manner. Calm, rational manner. This research identified the second point, and that's invalidation. And I know again, it appears that we're good at doing this also. But it is a danger sign, it's a risk factor. And it involves one or both of the parties in a marriage, either overtly, openly, or subtly, putting your spouse down, talking down to them. You all know what they're talking about, eh? We invalidate an individual. We make them feel less than. We discount their thoughts and their feelings and their fears. We speak with them with contempt. And they hear and they feel the contempt in our voices and by the remarks that we make. Sometimes it takes the form of us being sarcastic in the things that we say and we throw at them. Sometimes we may say it and we may think that it's nothing but it's sarcastic and it's invalidation. We, sometimes we may say, well, I forgot that, that I'm lucky to be married to you. Being sarcastic. But there's a deeper message in the statement. Invalidation could take the form of insults. Sometimes it is words that is aiming at breaking down an individual. It's showing them that, look, I'm smarter than you. I'm better than you. And sometimes we get to the point where we call our spouses fool. We call them stupid. We call them retarded. We call them dumb. We tell them that they cannot do anything right. This is invalidation. We are discounting their feelings. We are discounting who they are. We attack them with our words. Our contemptuous words. And the goal is to break them. Research has found that invalidation is one of the best predictors of future problems and even divorce. Jesus taught that attacks on the character of another person are, are not right. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 22 it says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin but if anyone says, you fool, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. The antidote for invalidation is validation. And we, we validate one another when we accept the feelings of one another. This doesn't mean that we may agree with our spouse on a particular issue. But it means that we will respect them enough to listen to what they have to say and attempt to understand their perspective on an issue as opposed to discounting what they have to say and making them feel less than. I suggest you that providing care and concern and comfort builds up a marriage. But we invalidate our spouse when we do not care on, about their fears and their feelings. And we build barriers and we build walls that will destroy our relationships. As I hasten on, this third risk factor that they identified among these 135 couples was something that they call negative interpretation. 
And again, we good at this. I, I, I know individuals who are very good at this. Not my wife. <laughs> but I know individuals who's good at this. Negative interpretation is when one partner consistently, not sometimes, but consistently believe that the motives of the other party is more negative than what it really is. They always tend to think the worst. You all understand what I say? This is a destructive pattern. And it erodes the intimacy in a marriage. Let me give you an example of negative interpretation. At one time, before you were dating, you and your husband, you all used to carry you to the movies, carry you to dinner. Every weekend, you spend lavishly on you. You're here, here late. He's not been doing that. And so, in your mind, uh, well, my husband no lovely no more. Or he must be yet somebody else. He don't want to carry out in public. He's, you see the negative interpretation? When the reality is, you all just finished talking about getting a house and he trying to save some money towards his house. And so he cut down. Now that reveals some other issues, communication issues also. But the man just trying to save money for your future, but you jump in thinking, well, the man got somebody else, or the man don't want to carry out no more. You just understand what negative interpretation is? When we put our own spin on something, really and truly, that is not, talk to one another. Communicate. Ask why. And sometimes when we consistently do this, you know, we wear our spouse down to the point where they eventually give up. Man, they ain't even trying to clarify no more. Believe what you want to believe. You get them to that point. And your mind just constantly go into the negative part. You know, sometimes just some people just naturally just negative. They always seem to believe the worst. That's not good in a marriage. You know, a, another kind of negative interpretation is mind reading. And a lot of us mind read. Now, mind reading is okay once you read in the mind and you're attributing some positive stuff to the individual. But when you mind read an individual and you're attributing something negative, then that's when you get yourself in some problems. Tell if you sound, you know that. Like. <laughs> you know, you, you believe that you know why your husband do X. Or husband, you believe you know why your wife do Y. I mean, you, you're trying to read their mind. Sometimes you may be right, but not every time. Sometimes we sometimes be perceive wrong and interpret wrong. And then we attempt to read people's mind as opposed to finding out what's on the person's mind. We can have some of the problems. And again, the research suggests that when you consistently allow this risk factor to exist, negative interpretation, you start reading things in and making up boogeymans where there's none, you end up in problems. The key to overcoming negative interpretation is to stop trying, you know, you know if you want to know what you're supposed to think, ask them what they think. Also, be more positive, have a more positive outlook. Stop always assuming the worst in your spouse. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says, so We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And that's what we need to do. You know, we need to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Sometimes things is not how we perceive them to be. Sometimes we need to examine our own attitudes. To see if we have the right attitude. Sometimes we have to give the benefit of the doubt. 
Stop thinking the worst about one another. Be more positive. The fourth and final risk factor that the research identified was withdrawal and avoidance. So, and I know, I know we have a lot of people that do this very well too. Withdrawal and avoidance. You know, this is when you have a partner that don't like to deal with the problems. They will do anything possible to get out of dealing with an issue. It's like they are afraid to deal with conflicts. And so they will avoid it. They will, I mean, they will anything possible to avoid dealing with an issue. All kind of gymnastics. It could be to the point where they, when, it's, when, it's a, when it's a conversation start, they may get a little contentious, that they will get up and they will leave, and leave the next party that is hanging, no issues, never resolved, sounding familiar. Or they don't even want to start talking about the issue. They just avoid the issue altogether. And sometimes uh, issues are never resolved because they either leave the room or they leave the house. They come home and they think you sleep. And when you wake up, they go in the next room, go watch TV, get on the scene. I don't want a noise around my head, this, that, another. Avoidings and withdrawal. That's not healthy. Essentially, that's sweeping it under the carpet. And it may bring some peace on, in the short term. But in the long term, it will result in a major war in your house. Yes, dealing with issues is never pleasant. And sometimes people withdraw because they say, well, look here, this woman is making me mad. If I let this woman run on, she can run me hot. You know, you know, fellas, you all know. Not these fellas in here now. You all know how the fellas out there is doing it. You all know how the neighbors them is doing it, right? So, because he don't run hot, he ain't even gonna start something that he know he can't finish. This is not healthy. It is not healthy. It is one of those risk factors that indicates that there is a serious challenge in your marriage. Now, I give you the symptoms. You know, they, they tell you what the symptoms of a heart attack is. Uh, we're grand. We get some other noises. Freddy. Uh, we generally know if you feel a little pain in your chest, they say, or you feel a little shoulder pain, hey, what else? Jaw pain. Uh, something wrong. Keep coughing and go to the hospital. Yeah. So we know the symptoms of certain catastrophic illness, eh? And for the most part, we tend not to ignore them, particularly if the symptoms are clear. I've given you the risk factors for your marriage. If you have any of those symptoms, get some help. Other than that, you're going to have a heart attack. You know, the scriptures encourages us uh, not to separate what God has joined together. The earlier we begin to recognize that there's a problem in our marriage, the better our chances of salvaging our marriage. The more alert we are in recognizing those risk factors that they say, the better the chances are that we are able to remedy them and to seek help in overcoming those challenges. God's word is our guide. If we simply live and treat one another as God's word encourages us to live and to treat one another, we will overcome a lot of the challenges that we have. We ought to watch out. Watch out for those things that are enemies to our marriages. Those things that will destroy our marriages. All of the things that people say these are the causes of our marriages. 
Before it gets to those points, there are a lot of other things that were going on before. The thing that you attribute the end of your marriage, that's just the last straw. Question you need to ask, what all happened in between the points of head over heels in love? To I can't stand this individual no more. It's those points in between that we want to get you to address. So that you do not get to the end point. When it may be too late. But as long as there's life, there's hope. God is good. God created marriage. And God has given us the solutions to the problems that we will face in our marriages. But I want to encourage you. If you need help, seek help. But God is good. Save yourselves. Save your marriages.